feels like the Watergate hearings with all these cameras pointed at me. <laughs> You're the interrogator, huh? Well, who are you, Sam Rayburn? Is that who that was? <laughs> okay, I guess we'll get started here. Uh, uh, my topic, um, the culture of violence uh, in America, myth versus reality, is a, a, a part of a book I'm working on, a, a chapter. And uh, the, the working title of this book is False Virtue, The Myth of American Exceptionalism. And uh, what this is about is that... Uh, during and shortly after the American Civil War, the U.S. government is said to have had a treasury of virtue because of what it did in the Civil War and, and what it did in the years thereafter. And uh, there's a little book by the poet and novelist Robert Penn Warren, who uh, many of you are probably familiar with. He, he won, uh, four, I think, four Pulitzer Prizes. Uh, All the King's Men is his, fam his most famous novel. Uh, it was made into a movie. And he wrote a little book about uh, the legacy of the American Civil War, uh, which is where I got the idea for this title, False Virtue. And uh, I'm going to read you just one, one thing he said. He said, uh, this treasury of virtue that the U.S. government is said to have had after the Civil War is, uh, quote, the justification for our crusades of 1917 and 1918 and 1941 and 1945 and our diplomacy of righteousness with the slogan of unconditional surrender and universal rehabilitation for others, not for Americans, for others. And then he said, this, this treasury of virtue is, quote, a plenary indulgence for all sins, past, present, and future, end quote. And I think he's exactly right about that. That's what so-called American exceptionalism is. The government claimed that it was so virtuous by its acts that uh, all future acts are virtuous by definition because the people perpetrating the acts are so righteous, the most righteous people in the world, in fact. And so the theme of my book is uh, that this is all nonsense, essentially. <laughs> chapter after chapter, I'm writing about what the government actually did with all this virtue in the, in the decades after the Civil War. And this, and this culture of violence uh, topic is just one uh, short chapter. And uh, what it's about, it starts out with uh, a discussion of some research by some friends of ours, Terry Anderson and P.J. Hill, on the American West. And it turns out that the American West, the American frontier, that is, before there was a state uh, in, in the frontier, when the European immigrants uh, just went out there, and there were no state governments, no, no federal government had any authority out there at the time, there was no presence, uh, it was a very peaceful place. Contrary to all those Clint Eastwood movies you've all seen, uh, the civil society was a very peaceful place, uh, re relatively, certainly more peaceful than American cities uh, today. And here's what Anderson and Hill said. This was an article they published in the Journal of Libertarian Studies in 1979. They said that the West is perceived as a place of great chaos with little respect for property or life. But our research indicates that this was not the case. Property rights were protected and civil order prevailed. Private agencies provided a necessary basis for an orderly society in which property was protected and conflicts were resolved. Uh, like I said, that's a very totally the opposite of what you get from the, from the movies. And I think this is an important uh, line of research because uh, the historians uh, totally miss this in most of the treatments of the American West, but they miss it by simply assuming that it was a very violent place and then they write books and articles about the possible causes of all the violence. But they assume as a given that there was violence. And then they always come to this conclusion that uh, this is one uh, author named uh, Joe France. American violence today, today reflects our frontier heritage. So they blame a lot of the violence in American cities today for this frontier heritage. Uh, and it's, uh, it's just a totally false analogy, I think, because it wasn't that, um, that violent. And so, uh, but there was, there was another area of violence. I'm going to talk about the real violence. Uh, not the real Lincoln, as, but the real violence. Uh, and so, you know, what were these, these institutions? Anderson and Hill talk about institutions that created this peaceful society. One of them was land clubs. 
Uh, these were organizations established by settlers, and they had their own constitutions. They had, you know, when they settled the land, they administered land claims, they protected themselves from outsiders, they arbitrated disputes. So they just didn't go into anarchy and, and uh, with the Wild West and gunslingers and everybody shooting each other uh, every day. That's uh, pretty much uh, well, the image you get when you watch the Western uh, movies. Uh, the wagon trains did the same thing. Wagon trains that were miles long with pe people heading uh, from the east to the west in America, they established their own constitutions also, and usually ostracism or threats of being kicked out were sufficient to discipline uh, the miscreants, the people who were b behaving badly. And so uh, it was not necessary to use violence very often with the wagon trains. Mining camps, some of my, I was very disappointed when I read about this because some of my favorite movies are about the violence in mining camps. <laughs> the, 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 the drunkenness and the shootouts and all that. But, you know, Lee Marvin was one of my favorite actors on, on, in that regard. But, it, but the mining camps did this, essentially the same thing. They, they, uh, when they established a camp, you had to sign a contract as a member of the mining camp. And these contracts established your property right in a section of land where you would mine for gold or whatever, and, and you would have property rights to any gold found on your land. And these were all enforced by the miners themselves. And uh, simply, if you did not abide by the rules of the contract, then uh, the rest of the miners would simply declare that your property was fair game for anyone, that anyone could mine on your property. It was, uh, and they could jump your claim, as they say. And that was enough of an incentive to pretty much get people to, to behave and, and, uh, and to, without violence, without violence. And it was pretty well self-enforcing. Cattlemen's associations, cattle ranchers, did something similar. They hired private protection agencies to uh, discipline uh, rustling. And uh, in the literature, uh, it says that many of them were staffed by expert gunmen, sharpshooters, and I would think that the mere knowledge that there were sharpshooters around would deter rustling, cattle rustling. Uh, and it apparently did, so it wasn't uh, uh, violent. And these, these expert gunmen did not become criminal gangs like some have predicted would occur with private law enforcement. Uh, some of them were criminals, but they didn't, it wasn't a real big, big problem. So these are, in short, these are the, uh, briefly, these are the institutions that Anderson and Hill uh, dem uh, uh, demonstrated uh, were very well thought out and worked very well. And it's not just Anderson and Hill, there, was other, there are other writers that I cite that have found the same thing. It was a, a relatively peaceful place. And, uh, but Anderson and Hill, they leave it there. Uh, that's, their, that's the end of their story. And uh, the second section of my paper is on what I call the real cause of violence in the American West. There was a culture of violence on the American frontier. Uh, it just, it wasn't in the civil society. It was primarily uh, the U.S. government's war on the Plains Indians uh, that, that did create a, a, a spectacular culture of violence in the American West. And you have to understand a few things. I want to quote uh, an economist named Jennifer Roback, who was an old friend of mine, and, uh, and she wrote an article in 1992 about uh, the relationship between the Europeans and the Indians in terms of land settlement. And she said this, Europeans generally acknowledged that the Indians retained possessor, possessory rights to their lands. More importantly, the English recognized the advantage of being on friendly terms with the Indians. And now, now get this, this is a shocking statement. Trade with the Indians, especially the fur trade, was profitable, but war was costly. Who would ever have thought that, that it would be in the, the interest of people to trade to their mutual benefit rather than engage in war, which is, and of course, there's nothing more costly than war, ever. And by the 20th century, about $800 million had been paid for Indian lands. So there was a lot of cooperation between the European uh, immigrants and, and the Indians over land, and there, and there was uh, a sense of uh, property rights being exchanged over the land. That all changed, though, during and then after the American Civil War. Uh, just two months after the American Civil War was ended. It ended uh, essentially in April of 1865. And, uh, and by July of 1865, uh, the famous General Sherman was given command of the what was called the Military District of the Missouri. The U.S. government put uh, the United States into military districts. There were no longer states for a while. Were, everything was a military district. And the whole country essentially was divided into military occupation districts.
um, for, for a while. And uh, Sherman's job was to commence a campaign of extermination against the Plains Indians. And he's very clear about uh, why he was given this job. He stated, he stated in his memoirs that uh, his job was to clear the way for the government subsidized transcontinental railroads. So it was essentially a, fail, a form of veiled corporate welfare for the railroad corporations, which were uh, part of the financial backbone of the Republican Party at the time. Abraham Lincoln, after all, was a, a counsel for the Illinois Central Railroad. Uh, and so they, they were, uh, uh, it was a political, political payback, essentially. Uh, a man named Grenville Dodge was the chief engineer of the Transcontinental Railroads. He was a friend of Lincoln's, and uh, during the war, he was given the task of, of uh, clearing the Indians out of the way for the, to commence the building of the railroad. The Transcontinental Railroad, subsidized by the U.S. government, was uh, uh, commenced in 1862, right in the middle of the Civil War. And uh, Murray Rothbard wrote about this, and he said this, in this way, Conscripted Union troops and hapless taxpayers were coerced into socializing the costs of constructing and operating the Union Pacific. So it was essentially a way of socializing the cost of building the railroad. And I've written elsewhere about um, the great James J. Hill, who was a man from the state of Minnesota who built a privately funded transcontinental railroad without any government aid, even land grants. And he paid the Indians for rights of way with livestock, grain, whatever they could trade for, money, uh, uh, but because he was a private enterprise. Uh, the government enterprises uh, just called in the army to kill all the Indians, and, some, and quite a few whites as well who stood in the way of, of, of the railroads. And that's what Murray Rothbard was talking about. And so as soon as they began this, after the war had ended, Grenville Dodge, Abraham Lincoln's old buddy, his old friend, proposed making slaves of the Indians. And, and he said this, um, quote, with the army furnishing a guard to make the Indians work and keep them from running away. That was Grenville Dodge. And the government decided, though, to kill them instead. So, so immediately after the Civil War, two months later, here's uh, Grenville Dodge proposing creating a new class of slaves, the Indians, and using uh, US government troops as the overseers to build the railroads. Uh, they didn't do that, though, as I said. They decided that it'd be uh, more economical, I guess, to just kill all the Indians. And so that's what they did. Uh, the president of the United States at the time was Ulysses Grant, and uh, he appointed his friend Sherman uh, as the commanding general, and he, in turn, uh, appointed uh, another general, Philip Sheridan, to be in charge of the extermination of the Indians. And one of the biographers, Michael Fellman, said this, thus the great triumvirate of the Union's Civil War effort formulated and enacted military Indian policy until reaching by the 1880s what Sherman sometimes referred to as the final solution to the Indian problem. That kind of has a ring to it, doesn't it? The final solution to the Indian. That came from uh, William Tecumseh Sherman. Uh, and what did this involve? It involved, uh, I'm quoting Michael Fellman again, the biographer of Sherman, killing hostile Indian, Indians and segregating their pauperized survivors in remote places. These men apply their shared ruthlessness, born of their Civil War experiences against the people all three despised. Sherman's overall policy was never accommodation and compromise, but vigorous war against the Indians. They were a less than human and savage race. Uh, and so all, so the, all the same generals, all the general Custer, uh, Hancock, uh, Sherman, Sheridan, Grant, they were all involved immediately in the eradication of the Plains Indians after the war for the benefit of the railroad corporations primarily, and uh, for the same people. Uh, Sherman, uh, Sherman's uh, motivation is kind of interesting. He, he, thought, of, uh, uh, he thought of the Indians in the, in the same way as he thought of uh, Southerners in the, during the Civil War. And, uh, and also, here's one thing he, uh, that he said about the Indians. He said, the in quote, I'm quoting, the Indians give a fair illustration of the fate of the Negroes if they are released from the control of the whites. So there was this idea that there was a, a, a savage race that uh, de uh, they dehumanized the, uh, the Plains Indians as much as possible. Uh, and because, of course, that's always what happens whenever any government isn't planning on exterminating anybody. They have to demonize first. And so there was a huge campaign of demonization 
uh, by Sherman and Sheridan and, and the rest. And they actually called for what they called a racial cleansing of the land, beginning with the Indians. And Sherman and Sheridan are famously attached to the old saying, uh, "All uh, the only good Indian is a dead Indian. That's another charming uh, part of American history. I think, uh, I think my friend Bob Higgs wrote a recent article on lourockwell.com entitled, Great Moments in American Statesmanship. And he included statements like this in there from uh, all sorts of American politicians. And to give you an idea of what went on, there were more than a thousand attacks on Indian villages. This went on from 1865 to 1890. And typically they would attack an Indian village with women and children in it, and they would do most of it in the winter months when the families would all be together, uh, when the, the men were not out hunting uh, as much uh, as they would be in the, in, the, in the warmer weather. And they also waged a war of extermination on the American buffalo because the, the buffalo, the animal, the buffalo, was used was the chief source of protein, meat for the Indians. They used it for the, the hides for clothing. They even used the sinews for fish hooks. And they used every part of the buffalo. And so it was official U.S. government policy to exterminate the buffalo because uh, they thought that would starve out the Indians, if nothing else. And so um, uh, the, the so-called tragedy of the commons is not the only reason why the American buffalo almost became extinct. It was also uh, official government policy to bring hundreds and hundreds of hunters out there to shoot uh, literally uh, 100, 200, 300 buffalo a day for as long as you could stand and, and shoot uh, the buffalo. And it, it said that the Great Plains just had you know, the stench of dead rotting carcasses for years and years uh, because of this. Uh, General Sheridan himself said this about this killing of the buffalo. He said, uh, when, when some a group of Texans asked him if he couldn't do something to stop this extermination of these animals, and he said, let them kill, skin, and sell the buffalo until the buffalo is exterminated, as it is the only way to bring lasting peace and allow civilization to advance. Now, that was, that was his, uh, his thinking. And uh, I'm gonna, I'll give you just one example of the sort of thing that went on in these attacks on Indian villages. There's a, a famous uh, massacre known as the Sand Creek Massacre. Uh, the Indians were Cheyenne and Arapaho, Arapaho Indian tribes, and they had made peace with the U.S. government. And the U.S. government told them, just fly our flag and we will know you, you're friendly and we will leave you alone. And they had a formal treaty, a formal agreement to, to live in peace on the Sand Creek in southeastern Colorado. And so, uh, but uh, some of the, the U.S. Army had different plans. It apparently stood somewhat in the way of the railroad line. And there was a colonel, an Army colonel named John Shivington. And he invaded uh, this, uh, this village. And uh, it's described in a book called Crimson Perry, The Indian Wars, by a man named S.L.A. Marshall. And S.L.A. Marshall was the U.S. government's official historian of the European theater of war in World War II wrote 30 books on American military history. So this is quite a, quite a knowledgeable man about, about American military tactics. And, uh, and he wrote about this, and I'll give you one, just one uh, description. He says, uh, Shivington's troops, when they attacked this village, they began a, quote, began a full day given over to bloodlust, orgiastic mutilation, rape, and destruction with Shivington looking on and approving. Upon returning to Denver, Denver, Colorado, he and his raiders demonstrated around the city, waving their trophies, scalps, uh, more than 100 drying scalps. They were acclaimed as conquering heroes. Uh, and then there's a, another famous book called Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee by Dee Brown. Dee Brown is sort of the preeminent historian of the American West. And he wrote about, uh, he, died, he died a few years ago. He wrote about the Sand Creek Massacre. And, and he said this, and, th and this is based on the military records, the records that were taken by the U.S. Army of what happened. And he said, when the troops came up to the squaws, the women, the, the women ran out and showed their persons to let the soldiers know that they were squaws and begged for mercy. But the soldiers shot them all. There seemed to be indiscriminate slaughter of men, women, and children. The squaws offered no resistance. Everyone was scalped. And, and, uh, so that was, that was Shivington. And the orders that Sheridan gave to, uh, to the troops were uh, to kill or hang all the warriors. 
But in implementing this order to kill or hang all the warriors, uh, the army decided it would be too difficult in a battle, in an ongoing battle, to distinguish between the warriors and the non-warriors. And so they just killed everybody. Uh, it was too difficult to pick out who's a woman, who's a, who's a, who's a child. So they just killed everybody. Uh, and uh, SLA Marshall, the man who wrote 30 books on American military history, he called Sheridan's order to, to Custer, Custer was carrying a lot of this out, quote, the most brutal orders ever published to American troops. And this is from a man who wrote 30 books on American military history. Uh, and one, one of the more charming aspects of all this is that the famous Custer, George Armstrong Custer, uh, during every battle when they were attacking these villages in this way, he brought a band with them. As soon as they would leave their fort, they would bring a band, a, a marching band, and they would play an Irish jig called Gary Owens. Uh, and so if you can imagine all this killing going on with a band playing uh, an Irish jig. And uh, Marshall said, and I'm quoting Marshall, this was Custer's way of gentling war. It made killing more rhythmic. Uh, kind of reminds me of how the Nazis played violin music as they marched Jews into the uh, gas chambers uh, in the, uh, during the Holocaust. Uh, and so... And so this is the real culture of violence in America. This is where the real, if there was a culture of violence on the frontier, this is where it came from. It wasn't the civil society at all. So the historians who blame today's violence on the culture of violence in the frontier, it was the military that created this violence. And, and, and military men who were among the most violent. Uh, they even recruited ex-slaves who came to be known as the Buffalo Soldiers to mass murder Indians, women and children included. And they were celebrated now. There's movies made about them. There, there are monuments all over the place. There, there's a monument to the Buffalo Soldiers about a half a mile from my house in Maryland. And, uh, and the, but when you think of what they were doing, you know, why is this something that, that should be boasted about? And uh, you know, as far as what, what kind of culture was created here, uh, in the paper I quote uh, a World War II combat veteran named Paul Fussell who's written several books on, on war. Uh, he became a writer after the war. And as far as this culture of war, he, here's how he describes it. The culture of war is not like the culture of ordinary peacetime life. It is a culture dominated by fear, blood, and sadism, by irrational actions and preposterous results. It has more relation to science fiction or to absurdist theater than to actual life. And that's from a World War II veteran who fought in the Pacific and in Europe, uh, uh, saying that. And it echoes what Ludwig von Mises said about war in, in his great treatise, uh, Human Action. Uh, he said this, and I'll quote von Mises, what distinguishes men from animals is the insight into the advantages that can be derived from cooperation under the division of labor. Man curbs his innate instinct of aggression in order to cooperate with other human beings. The more he wants to improve his material well-being, the more he must expand the system of the division of labor. Concomitantly, he must more and more restrict the sphere in which he resorts to military action. And then he goes on to say that human cooperation under the division of labor in the civil society bursts asunder when citizens turn into warriors. And so that's a clear example of the, the civil society in the American frontier was motivated by the division of labor, cooperation in, in, in business enterprise and farming and agriculture and so forth so that everyone can prosper, gold, gold mining. Uh, but the military culture, the war culture, uh, yeah, that's the culture of violence and, and, uh, and the destruction of su uh, human civilization. And uh, at the very end of this, I'm going to expand this a little more uh, eventually, uh, I make some comments on this idea of uh, dehumanizing the Indians and how this process, uh, this, this model of first dehumanizing Southerners during the Civil War to justify, with big quotation marks, the bombing of Southern cities and the killing of 50,000 Southern civilians during the Civil War, uh, the same model was used in the Indian Wars and continued to be used into the 20th century. Uh, for example, when, uh, when the United States military assisted the Filipinos in, in, uh, in getting rid of the Spanish Empire, uh, the Filipinos apparently thought, uh, well, this is great, uh, no more Spanish Empire. But of course, the American Empire said, no, 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 you're part of the American Empire now. So of course, there was a war in, uh, in under Teddy Roosevelt's reign and his regime. And the American government ended up killing some 200,000 Filipinos. And here's what President Theodore Roosevelt said about the Filipinos who, 
to justify killing 200,000 of them. Uh, he said uh, he called them, quote, savages, half-breeds, a wild and ignorant people. So you have the President of the United States standing up in public saying this about an entire uh, country of people to justify the, uh, the killing of them. The same, so, something very similar happened about with regard to Germans in World War I. There was the massive uh, German pro, anti-German propaganda campaign to justify American entry in, into World War I. They made movies, posters, everything German was thought to be evil, that German Americans were imprisoned, uh, and, and so forth. And, but I see it as coming from the same model that was developed in a, uh, during the American Civil War and in the War on the Plains Indians. And so this is, uh, you know, the pur as I said, the purpose of this uh, writing, talking about this ugly history, is one, I want to demonstrate, I've demonstrated, I think, in this uh, article in the, in the book chapter, that this was mostly about money, uh, as most things are with regard to government. It was about uh, a veiled subsidy to the railroad corporations and all the associated businesses. As I said, James J. Hill built uh, the Great Northern Transcontinental Railroad, which was by far the most efficient railroad without any government money and without mass murdering the Indians. It's also very interesting that whenever the Indians were cornered by the U.S. Army, they would flee into Canada, and where they knew they would be safe. Uh, and Canada built a uh, transcontinental railroad, but uh, I don't believe they mass murdered any of the Indians or anybody else who was in their way. Uh, I doubt that Queen Victoria would have tolerated such a thing in Canada. And so uh, I think this is, this is a unique mindset of the American military establishment and the government uh, in the late 19th century uh, uh, because uh, you know, our neighbors to the north uh, did the same thing. They built a transcontinental and, and it didn't have, have to happen that way. And so this is a part of what they call American exceptionalism. It is exceptional behavior, isn't it? I would agree with that part of it, this sort of, this sort of behavior. But that's how, to this day, uh, they go about being the bully of the world because of this belief in the treasury of virtue in American exceptionalism. Uh, if you just read some of the articles by almost any neoconservative, you can pick out this sort of language somewhere. And I would refer you to Paul Gottfried on that. He's our expert on the neocons uh, out there. He hates them almost as much as I do, uh, as far as that goes. And uh, my time is about up, so uh, thank you very much. <laughs>